Good morning. You have tuned in to Just the Facts. I'm Marcy Strumgren, and I have in my in the studio today Lauren Martell, who is running for the school board in the third district in Duluth, Minnesota. Thanks, Lauren, for coming in. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Glad to have you here. Lauren has uh, been monitoring the school district for over a decade. Um, I think it all began with the red plan, as I recall. And uh, he's going to talk a bit about the financial picture of uh, our current uh, school district. And uh, since he writes in the reader on a monthly basis, uh, perhaps some of you have already noticed his uh, articles. Uh, it's like you're right there. When he gets done writing an article, I, you feel like you've been right there with him. So Lauren, let's get started with a little bit of your background. And uh, why is it that you're running uh, once again for a school district? Well, to be frank with you, I had no intention to run again. Um, uh, the primary reason I'm running is nobody else would get in. And I don't think that's good for democracy. And my opponent would have just stepped right in without any challenge. And, you know, I've been, as you said, been going in there for a long time. So I do think I have something of value to contribute to the conversation. Well, you understand the issues. There's no doubt about that, as, as, as you can tell when you're writing it. And when I was there uh, participating myself, um, you clearly understood what it seems like some of the board members are either totally ignoring or they just like to go along to get along. And I think we have enough cheerleaders in government today. What we really need is someone who's going to ask hard questions and hold people to the... To, uh, accountability. So uh, let's start out with uh, the financial picture of the Duluth district right now. Well, well okay, um, and I'm just going to back up just a bit. Okay. And I, I will just say that I do agree with you on that. And um, primarily what I want is intellectual diversity. I mean, they talk a lot about diversity, but you, you can have a diverse group. And they're all in the same camp, so you don't really have diversity. And I think that's what's slipping away from Duluth politics is intellectual diversity. Um, as far as the finances, there's no way I can even begin to cover it in, in a half hour. But um, you know, clearly there's been some financial issues, and the problem with the district is definitely on the finance, on the business side of, of the equation. It's not an educational problem per se. It's much more a business problem. And, Again, my opponent would have walked right in, and I don't believe he's ever been to a business committee meeting. And I've been following uh, the finances of the district for many years. Um, I haven't missed a business committee meeting in many years, and I've been to many more than the current board members. Um, you know, they're, they're saying that, you know, they balanced the budget this year. They're sort of bragging about that a bit. And, you know, I would argue that they didn't balance the budget. The taxpayers did. You know, a 20 and a half percent increase in the local levy balanced the budget. If all that money hadn't poured in and a lot more from the state as well, our district would have crashed in the statutory operating debt status. That's a fact. And um, that reality has to be acknowledged. I mean, uh, you know, they're using a metaphor now in the boardroom that they're turning the ship around and they're saying, give us some time. You know, it takes a while to turn the ship around. Um, you know, how the ship gets so far off course to begin with and how long are we supposed to wait for them to turn it around and what's the levy going to get to before they turn it around? It's gone from um, $11 million 13 years ago when Keith Dixon came to town, it's $40 million now. And they've already uh, announced in the boardroom that they're going to put another tax increase in place in December without voter approval. I don't know how much it's going to be yet. They don't have to tell the state till next month but you know, what have we been getting for this, for this investment? You know, are, are we really getting the true value of our tax dollars? That's the question everyone should ask. Well, when I listen to people having taken their um, students out of the district, putting them in other districts, obviously they're aware that they're not getting what they're supposed to get for their money when their students are failing and so it all ties into me, the financial picture ties into the educational issue. If you can't offer programs that other schools are offering and yours, you as a parent want those programs for your children, you're going to go somewhat place else because we have open enrollment, which 
certainly has not helped this district whatsoever. I know when Art Johnston was on the board, all he did was uh, remind them, and not all he did, but what he reminded them continually was the loss of students, which means the loss of money. And it seems to me that going to the taxpayers and using the students, as they have every single time they've asked for money, um, as their card to get what they want out of the, out of the uh, taxpayers, people need to wake up and they need to pay attention to what you've been saying and what others have been saying over the years. So let's talk about that financial uh, picture a little bit. Well, you hit one of the nails on the head, obviously is tied to enrollment. Enrollment is the base of the budget as the superintendent has repeated in the boardroom. And you know we drove the kids out. <laughs> we ran up a bill, nearly half a billion, and drove the kids out. That's just a fact, if it's a matter of record. Um, they were all in the News Tribune saying that they would all come back. Well, they never did. You know, they drove them out um, with the disruption of the plan and the dislike of the plan and the way it was being implemented. I mean, just the open enrollment, you mentioned that. Um, I've got the numbers right here. You know, in Dixon's first year, we had 129 in, 379 out. In his last year, we had 88 in and 627 out, just in those six years. It more than doubled out. And on top of open enrollment, you have homeschooling really taking off, and it's been an increasing challenge to brick and mortar, and you've got online education. And, you know, according to the Newest Tribune's uh, reporting about a year back, we now have 43 other educational venues operating in the area, um, you know, private schools and charter schools and various other entities out there operating. So people have a choice. I mean, they just have a choice, and it was, it's what I argued from the beginning. I didn't think they were going to create something that would be competitive in an increasingly competitive marketplace. It was clear that the marketplace was going to become much co more competitive. I said, you're looking backwards at 1892, the year they built Old Central, where you could just build whatever you wanted and they had no choice to, but to send their kids. This is a different environment. And we definitely have to turn that around. That would be the central um, priority for me is to get competitive in the marketplace and turn that around. We, we simply, we've lost so much money to that. Um, we're supposed to be at 9,600 students according to the Red Plan's projections. And they're projecting this year 8116, uh, 1,500 students below where they said we would be. That's $9.6 million lost in state aid just from the base formula alone. It's been devastating uh, to our budget. It's one of the primary drivers uh, of the budget problems, no doubt about it. You, you, hit, the, you hit it right on the head with that. Well, um, yeah, having, uh, I have some knowledge, but I don't know the figures very well, but I have some knowledge having monitored it for a decade. Um, the thing that bothers me is when I go someplace like I did last Sunday, and I don't normally, I'm not normally able to engage a person as vehement as this man was about what's going on in the district. He's still paying attention. But there was a real strong core group of people in the western part of the city, which he's sort of still speaking for. And, and he's saying what I've said, what you've said, what you know, many others have said. But the f newspaper fails to say that we've destroyed the Duluth School District um, because we had to have this makeover plan. Uh, Johnson Controls got away with uh, who knows what kind of um, poor quality buildings uh, with non-accountability for funds. Uh, that's still up in there, and that's something he really hit hard on is where did all the money go? How did Johnson Controls get so much money without accountability? And so I think that what we need to do is look at not just one seat being changed over, hopefully yours, uh, you getting that seat, but a few of the others so that we can get some real thinking into how are we going to pull these people back into the district? I mean, the kids that are already out, they're not going to come back. Those parents are happy with where they're at. The kids are happy with where they're at. But we need to pull, we need to make this district look like the upcoming generations are going to want to come into it and that those opportunities are there for those students. 
So he was very interesting to talk to, and quite frankly, it was refreshing to find somebody that he didn't have to argue or point out what uh, they didn't know. He, he was right on top of it. And so there's still people out there that are still as mad as they can be about this red plan. Oh, know? yeah, this, there's no doubt about it. I've been out quite a bit already, and, and the anger is as much as it's ever been. I've been out 10 times out of the last 11 years knocking on doors. Nobody's knocked on more doors and had more conversations than I have. It hasn't really lessened at all. Um, but I, I do, you know, I just want, I want to kind of back up and, and get at the, at the nub of what you were saying. You know, you know we've done this now, and, and, you know, they say it's all over, you know, and you, you're supposed to forget it. Um, and I understand, actually, to some degree, once something's done, you have to accept it in some ways. You can't, you can't undo it. But we still have the reality. I always tell people, you know, building the house is the easy part. If you made problem, you had made mistakes. I meant to say in, in in your financing, and it's killing your budget, and you know it's hurting your kids. It isn't over just because you built the house. You still have to figure out what to do, how to get out of the mess you're in. And if you deny the problem, you can't solve it. You, the only way you can solve a problem is to get an honest assessment of it, and 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 face into it in real terms and look for a solution. Um, I personally think that. You know, the time has come for that real conversation. Um, I'm actually happy that the superintendent's moving on. He's been on one side of the issue for years, and, and I think he's been something of a roadblock in having an honest conversation. I mean, you, know, you can do what they've been doing, um, and you can continue to do that. And, and I think, you know, 10, 12, 15 years down the road, you're still going to have to deal with reality because I don't think this plan ultimately can work it was just a bad plan to begin with. It was a bad fit for the city. We pointed it out, you know, that it's a city 30 miles long. You get rid of all your central schools, you build a big, big palaces on either end, you're not going to end up with educational equity, and clearly it hasn't worked. It, you know, the West is lagging far behind on average than the East. So, you know, what is the city going to do about that? You know, again, you can just keep following them. They'll keep jacking the levy and put a little band-aids on it, trying to make it work. Ultimately, I think we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. So you put enough money in to bring the Western schools up and make it work, I think. You know, that's one option that's out there. The other option, I think, is just going back to the drawing board now before we dump prime real estate in the middle of the city, 77 acres and three multi-million dollar buildings for virtually no profit at all, and that's where they're leading us here, you know? Uh, and, then, and then where are we, you know? Um, then we got to, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, we have to finally adjust to the reality that this was a bad plan and a bad fit for the city. So I would like to have that conversation. I think that we could make some moves here that would sort of give us a softer landing and start moving us towards a solution. Um, they've been stuck in a rut since Keith Dixon came to town. Um, they don't seem to be able to lift their heads up out of that and look around. They just are just forcing us down a narrow track, the same group that's been handing the baton of power off to each other. And I do think it's time for some other voices to be let in and some other true ideas to be explored and let's look at what, what we can do. I, one other option that I threw out there long ago, I said, especially after the real estate crash, I said, here we are with this prime real estate. We're trying to push it in a bad market. You know, and we're not going to make any profit on this deal. It was obvious, and I said, let's, why don't we just lease it for a while? There were some people out there that were interested in a lease, and I said, let's put it into a suspended, self-sustaining loop here for a while, and just, we can maybe bring it back in if they're wrong, which I've always believed they were, and that we just have to turn around and rebuild central schools anyway. So I said, let's just put it in, you know, we can, if they're right, we can always sell it down the road, maybe in a better market but we're not losing all this money year after year after year on 77 acres of prime real estate and three multi-million dollar buildings. I just felt that was just a loser hand that they dealt us, and here we are over eight years sitting on it. And I was up there not long ago checking out the property, and it's just really distressing to walk around there. I circled the high school from both directions with a notepad and pencil, and I counted uh, 19 window panes smashed out and replaced with particle boards. Particle board, I meant to say, and and you know that's just that's just a terrible waste of our wealth and resource. It really is. And to see those tennis courts, eight tennis courts we built, 
new, a new uh, uh, track up there. We put almost $2 million just 10 years before we shut it down into that facility. And, those, and to see all those facilities just rotting away now, that's just, that's just terrible mismanagement of our resources and our money. And we need, a, we need better government than that, clearly. I, I just think you know, future generations are going to find themselves on a tough road if we don't get better value from our tax dollars. We just can't allow this. I think it's very disrespectful to the citizens who voted in these tax increases. I think it flies in the face of responsibility to those that pay the bill. Oh, and I, I and that blindness, you, yeah. the blindness of most of those people on the board is appalling. But it seems like government will do what they want to do, when they want to do it, if they want to do it, and excuse me for the expression, be damned the public. That's what I have seen happen. We know um, from past programs that they built the um, Expensive uh, STS, I think they call that secondary. ST, uh, uh, secondary tech center. Secondary STC, tech, yeah. tech center. Yeah. And we hadn't even paid off the mortgage on that when they closed it down. I think it took three, I could be wrong on that, three years after the campus was closed before they ever paid off that uh, amount of money. And, you know, how tragic it is to see those tracks and and uh, courts never being used. I've seen them with grass in them long before you were up there. I was up there myself. And so it's deplorable what has happened to our, our, our hard-earned tax dollars for virtually nothing. And we had a good offer on it. Would the uh, charter school ever come back and give us another offer? More than likely, it would be a whole lot less than 14.2 million. Yeah. And of course, we were promised and promised how these schools would pay down the incredible debt that we're forced to uh, pay out now. And of course, our interest rates are high because we have to uh, pay these payments all the time and, and there's no way, there's no extra money to pay them down sooner. So the whole thing was a kick in the face to the public, a lie sold by Dixon and his crew and some of the former board members. It's, it's appalling to me. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm sure they were well intended. Um, people, I mean, obviously they were convinced they were doing the right thing. Um, you know, you, yeah. you can argue it, and, and it, to me, I don't know how they could have possibly felt that, but I'm sure they did. I mean, they and they actually always said that they were the ones that were truly concerned about the children. Of course, that's what Johnson Controls plays on. If you if you're against it, then you're against the kids, and of course they use that as their business strategy. But I do want to talk talk about STC a bit. Um, you're actually you're absolutely correct about that. That we had to pay 2.3 million actually off on the on the construction debt after they closed. Uh, those buildings were only 15 and 17 years old when we closed them down. They're still only 23 and 25 years old, as after sitting there over eight years. Um, you know that's that is inexcusable. And and you know, S STC that 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 programming um, career technical education is the cutting edge of the future. It really is, you know, and we had the nuts and bolts in place there to, to just soar. I mean, um, even Johnson Controls in its educational adequacy report called it a shining beacon and the reason that they had a positive open enrollment ratio in the upper grades, it was drawing kids in. It was an enrollment magnet. And it would even be more so as, as the world's moving more and more towards automation, et cetera. That's what's coming and that's the future for many kids. We had the nuts and bolts in place there to be just soaring ahead of everybody. And I still think we should take a look at whether or not we should maybe go back, you know, and see what it would really cost us to rethink what we're doing before we dump it. And, and the other thing that people don't realize, we could have sold that lower campus building several times, but what was hidden, and again, it was just because they did it in such a mass amount that nobody knew the fine detail of anything till after the fact, but those utilities, you need a right of way all the way across the property for the utilities for that lower campus building. And, you know, that's, you know, that's, that makes it def difficult to sell it separately and, and other, otherwise a developer has to put in new utilities and up there on that rock up there, that's an incredibly expensive thing to do. So that's what's hung up selling that bottom one and, and we're, not, we're gonna have a hard time selling it. Um, you know, we're practically giving those, you know, the last time they had a purchase agreement signed, they actually gave STC away because, because it was just difficult to sell. 
Um, and, and the other part of it is that the facilities management is in the upper campus building. They have nowhere to go. Once we sell, then we've got to figure out some place for facilities management, you know, and they were talking about putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into uh, uh, yeah, an old warehouse on Gar Garfield that they were actually supposed to sell with the red plant as well. Now they're talking about old central, maybe putting them into the basement of that. But I mean, it just shows the poor planning, you know, how bad the planning has been in this. And of course, old central now they say needs $48.5 million of work. And how much more will it cost if we got to sort of renovate it to put of facilities management in the basement of the place, um, you know, we have a fiscal um, um, catastrophe coming down the road on, on not only the failures of, of this, but also the poor planning of it. There's no maintenance component in this. From the beginning, I argued, you know, you're making all the buildings new or like new in a little span of time. You know, I said, how are you going to stagger out a sensible maintenance schedule from that? I said, it seems to me about 20, 30 years down the road, about the time we finally get this thing paid off, you've got to set up for a huge wave of maintenance. And that's exactly what the facilities manager is now warning them is coming. He says, we got about a 10, 10 year grace period left, and then we're going to get hit with, quote, a huge number. And they had no maintenance component in all the technology that they spent either. They spent about $8 million between installation and, and purchase of technology for the red plan, and now they're calling it ancient technology because they have no maintenance figured in, no way to upgrade anything, and they want to throw it all in dumpsters. That is just poor planning. I mean, it's just awful planning. This is supposed to be a long range plan. It was a bad plan from the start. That's why I fought against it so hard. I knew that we were going to be in a mess and that that mess would just keep getting worse. We've got to deal with it at some, at some point here, I think, if you wait another 10, 15 years, you're going to have people think, you know, that you're going to come out of this. I don't think so. You're going to have things cascading on you more and more here as this thing gets down the road because of their poor planning in terms of maintenance, primarily. They're robbing from the maintenance fund. We're supposed to have a maintenance levy of 5.6 million at 3.8, and they're taking a third of it out for salaries and benefits because the budget is in such poor shape. They were supposed to stop doing that this year and they couldn't do it. They had to leave that part, that part in there. So they're robbing from the maintenance fund. It's just, it's just a, a fiscal nightmare coming down the road on us at some point. It's going, to be, it's going to be a real tough road for people here and the taxpayer yet down the road if, if, if something isn't done to start mitigating this a bit. And again, I, you know, I, I, I don't doubt that they're well intended and, and you know, I like the DFLers, they're good people. Um, but they've controlled the room all these years, and I do think that we need to bring in a couple of new ideas, and we can't just keep gliding along here and hoping that they, that they pull us out of it, the same group that led us into it. I, I do think some new voices should be brought into the discussion at this point. Well, intentions are the road useless. The road to hell. <laughs> yes. Pave the road to hell pave, sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> and well, good intentions don't pay bills. They don't make people happy. They don't get students elected to, I mean, um, uh, educated to go out in this world and get a good job and uh, make a decent living for themselves and the f their futures. Good intentions have been, uh, to me, not even a part of the conversation. I, and uh, I give you credit for giving them grace, but I really don't give them any grace. I think some of what they've done was deliberate and we are suffering from it. Um, I won't say what building I was in, but I talked to the janitorial staff and uh, happens to be in charge of it all in this particular school. This is a couple years ago when I was taking a class through community education and they weren't getting the funds to do small maintenance back then and out of his own pocket he was fixing and doing things that should have, the money should have come from the district. So Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. You know, I don't mean to cut you off, but I do, I do, I will say that they're dedicated educators. And the superintendent is, um, the teaching staff is, they're dedicated educators. And I've told people time and again, you want to get a thriving school district, give them a blank check, you know. You give them a blank check, they'll, they'll deliver, they'll waste millions of dollars, they'll have us living under bridges from the tax levy, but you know, they do care about education and they will get there. And, they, and I do believe there's a lot of programs in place um, you know, that, 
that are real, more than well in, well intended. They're they're good programs, but I do think that you know at some point, and I think we're getting the signal closed down here a bit. But at some point, I think um, you know you have to get fiscal responsibility because otherwise you can't deliver on your good intentions, and exactly. that's the point. And yeah. what I what what I'm concerned is about their value is just more, 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 more. And I think there's another value that's equally important, and that is oh, I'm not supposed to tap on the on the table. I'm sorry, um, because of the microphone. But um, I I just want to say that there's another value that to me that's equally important and that's how the money is spent. Exactly. You know, and, and none of them ever go to the business committee meetings and that really bothers me, you know, that they're not there watching how, how the money's spent. And that, and, and really, you've got to, you've got to deliver on, on, on that part of it, the fiscal responsibility part of it, otherwise you can't deliver the education part of it. And this has been, I'll repeat, a business failure. This has been a finance failure, and we've got to straighten out that part of, the, of this operation. And I agree. Uh, I think something else that's missing on the uh, count, uh, school board and even on uh, other uh, elected positions, how many of these people actually own a brick, brick and mortar business within the city of Duluth and understand what it's like to have a profit and loss statement um, there's no money coming in from the public for a private business, so you've got to stay within that budget, and that is something that has to come to the table is this is a business. This yep. school district, the city council, the county commissioners, it's technically a business. Yes, it's a government business, but you can't continue to go to the deep pockets of the taxpayers because their pockets are not that deep anymore, and say, well, we just have to have more kids, money for these children or for whatever. Right, and if you I, could, have... I know we're running out of time, so if I can just throw one more yeah. thing in here quick. I, I think you're absolutely right. You have to follow basic bis business principles, and there's also one part of this that's very important. We haven't had a superintendent that actually lived in Duluth and owned a home and paid those taxes in 15 years. And I think that's another very important part of this too. You, have, you should have some skin in the game. I wish we could, we could force that with the new superintendent. We haven't talked about that, the superintendent search here, but I wish we can't legally. But I think we, we need to, to have somebody that has more skin in the game here. Um, I think they need to fill it themselves. The current CFO lives in another town. I, you know, I, when they jacked the levy 20.5%, I think it would be nice if we had a superintendent that actually lived in Duluth, owned a home, and paid taxes here and paid that 20.5% increase. And I'm sorry I interrupted you if you wanted to finish your thought. I'm yeah. sorry. No, I didn't right. want to run out of time. You yeah, know. We're, we're still good, but you're right. You're absolutely right. He does not live within the district, and that is another thing. But that changed many years ago, so you can live outside of this yep. the district. You can't that legally you force it, I know. But yeah. I mean, I, I really yeah. think that's an, that you know, it, it, it does speak to the whole attitude there towards the levy and everything. I do, I do believe that. I really do. And you're absolutely correct. I didn't mean, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I do think that basic business principles do apply here, and you can't violate basic. Um, business pr principles, finance principles, and run a good organization. And you need the support of the public at the same time for a public institution. So you have to treat the people with, with respect. And you have, to, you have to be aware that they're not just an ATM machine. You know, and, and that you have to deliver, you have to deliver good value for their dollars. That's very, very important. And, and they've lost a lot of trust because the people don't feel that they've done that. And it's really in, important, not only for, to run the, biz, the organization well, but to reestablish the trust with the community. They've got to see that, you know, that, and, and, and so far I haven't run into it out in the community. There's a lot of people that still don't believe that we're delivering um, good value for their tax dollars. I hear it all the time. Well, I'm glad to hear that there are people that recognize that. And of course, we have to go now to the fact that there is a vote coming up on November 5th. The primary uh, was poorly attended as usual and uh, the votes were low, but do you want a voice or not? 
that's now your choice to make and you need to really consider who you want to be on the uh, Duluth School District in the upcoming four years. And uh, I appreciate the fact that Lauren was able to come in today. And uh, so get in, uh, informed, tell your friends and neighbors, and think about what he has just got done saying so that on November 5th, you make the right choice. Thanks, Lauren, for coming yeah, in today. Thanks and so much for the opportunity. For all the hard work that you put into uh, your not on paid job that you do. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I've tried to be a, an informed citizen and that, and I really think it's very important to, to not just ride in the back seat anymore. You know, I, you know, I think citizens have to waken a bit and, and be willing to take the, the steering wheel a bit and just be more aware of what's going on. I think it's very, very important. So thanks, thanks for giving me this opportunity. You're welcome and thanks for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye now. Thanks so much. <laughs>